was uh, what would be the result. And so um, that was um, just to emphasize this idea that uh, when she talked uh, about a larger social system uh, that uh, a researcher should um, study, she was also applying it in, in her practice of science. So what I am, I am saying that, it's because she was not only doing uh, things uh, on the economics of discrimination, she also have a, a lot of things she did uh, toward uh, 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 the profession. And so everything she did was uh, uh, in a sort of way reflexive. I think I'm running out of time. So this is just fact about what she's done. Uh, after several times, she get a tenure job at MIT uh, Sloan School of Management. Uh, and uh, I have five minutes left, that's perfect. Uh, and so basically she wrote books, she continued research, uh, she um, uh, continue academic work. She have a, a lot of um, awards. She also there is a lot of um, narrative about how she actually mentored uh, 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 minorities and students and women. Uh, there is um, um, a black faculty group, an informal group at MIT that she was really part of, uh, and she did a lot of um, activity. Um, sorry. And this activity were also turned toward the profession. Uh, and so she participated in like um, uh, all the, the, the diversity initiative in the economics profession in the 70s and in the, in the 80s. Um, she left two funds uh, 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 for doctoral fellows and visiting scholar. Uh, she had tremendous activity as a board member in the, in the, in the Boston area, which is just very in interesting. And I want to, before talking about uh, the consequence for the history of economics, I, I just want to point to one last of all this activity, because basically what, why I, there is a lot of picture on those slides, it's because I want to give you a sense of every, like the, the sort of uh, plurality of things you were doing, but that we're going in the same direction and that there is a lot, a lot to say. There is a paper on each slide, basically. Um, the last point I want to say is uh, she was part of the Boston Museum of Fine Art Committee to open the museum to new audiences. Um, and she also had a personal passion for Nubian art. And what is really interesting is like at the same time, there was a, 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 a sort of mobilization, a social movement, if, if you want to say, or like activism to change the perception of history. Uh, and it's still on. And the idea that Egyptian history has been uh, whitewash uh, is a very strong debate that we are having now. And so this this means that um, here, what's interesting is like um, she she was uh, an, a sort of activist also on the representation, but like we on every every um, um, in every social activity basically. Uh, your work, uh, art, uh, uh, the way you talk, et cetera, et cetera. So what does it say? Um, um, so yeah, just to sum up what I just say, uh, it's interesting because you have a sort of, when you look at her life, you have a sort of list of everything you can do to change status quo uh, at the time, the status quo, of the time. So gather new data and new facts, produce new knowledge, uh, fight to change the law, uh, fight to have more people in every place, uh, academia, business, be a role model, uh, change representations. So all these things. Uh, and it's a sort of integrated approach, approach to social change, uh, which is very anchored on, in, in policy world of the post-war period. Uh, but it's not written in a treaty. So there is no treaty about how do we change the world and we just uh, decide to, she, did, she didn't produce uh, a, a treaty on social change. She didn't produce what would be a treaty on the economics of discrimination. But when you look at her practice, uh, you have a view about uh, how, how the knowledge of economics can be used to do things uh, in the real world. So on this slide, uh, the things I want to say um, is, um, Two things. So, on on one side, you have the idea that it was difficult for her to go to the uh, ASA meeting uh, 
uh, uh, in, in, in the 50s because she was black. And on the other side, you have the idea that um, um, uh, many theories of discrimination written by economists are not policy oriented. Uh, and basically, uh, in this work, what I want to do is uh, by looking at her practices uh, 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 to see what, what was the conception of discrimination that was different from uh, the theories written and published in major economic journal at the time. Uh, and so for me, looking at what she did, the practice, and especially the practice outside academia, you have an idea about uh, how she saw um, uh, uh, discrimination as um, one part of a bigger problem uh, that was uh, inequality. Uh, and so that's the second point uh, that working on, on her um, uh, practice is really alighting. And the last point, which I think, which I must say it's difficult because this is exactly, this is what I want to work on and I didn't talk about it since the beginning of this talk, uh, the absence of racism from the narratives. And when I say the narratives, I, I, so I don't think Becker has a theory of racism at all. Uh, I don't, and there is economists who have theory of racism, uh, but it's, it's really different uh, from um, uh, uh, what other social science were doing at the time. And I, would, I was very surprised that in the work of uh, Wallace, I didn't find either narrative of uh, racism, but I do find a lot on a conception of systemic uh, uh, inequality uh, that she was implementing in her practice rather than uh, writing about it. Uh, so that's why I think we should look more at practices uh, uh, and more on the absence of some narrative. So why racism is not part of the narrative uh, at the time. Uh, and I must say that um, in the post war development of economists, like the transition from eugenics to something else, uh, like do economists fight against racism? Uh, do, how do they expurge the eugenics um, uh, roots uh, in terms of the roots in the ideas in the model? Um, uh, there is not a lot on the transition out of it. Uh, and so that's basically uh, where this um, uh, um, yeah, project is about. And of course, that means we'll need to work a little bit more on uh, dispositional knowledge, uh, who is talking, why, uh, and so that's what's the link between the profession and the production of, uh, 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 of knowledge. Last point, and then I finish. Um, if you look at her trajectory, um, I work on the economist on the same period, and I found it very successful and common, um, like government economists, at the time it was fashionable, it's still fashionable, but uh, not the same. Um, then she get a tenure. Um, one can say it's very late uh, to get a tenure. So common trajectory in terms of topic and in terms of type of employment, but except it was not common for um, uh, non uh, for, for African American women. And so I think it's there is a tension for me in the narrative about she did things that that um, uh, could fit into a, a, a narrative of what's the economics prof of uh, sorry the economics profession in the past war period, but also she doesn't fit because uh, 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 she's, she's a pioneer and an exception. Uh, 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 so that's the way I have difficulty to write the narrative. And I stop there because I don't have time. I don't. Oh. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks very much, Cleo. That's great. Um, before I call on Guy, I'd just like to draw the panelists' attention to the question and answer box. Unfortunately, it's not available to everybody, but there are some very good comments on all of the papers that you might want to follow up. And I think I'm going to hand this over to Guy. And, okay, uh, thank you, right. Evelyn. Um, let me know if you can all see the document. Well, thank you, Cleo. Uh, this is a great presentation, great work. And I'm pretty sure that um, uh, members of the NEA, um, you know, look forward to seeing where this research is going. Um, I only have limited comments um, and it's in no way reflection of a reflection of, you know, the quality of the work. Um, I only uh, 
had a short amount of time to, you know, uh, review it. So uh, very limited comments. So what I would like to do here is to provide general comments and, and also suggestions and leads uh, for further research. Um, as you brilliantly uh, exposed, um, the, the, the paper chronicles the journey of, of Phyllis Wallace as a, a Black woman and as a Black uh, economist. Um, and there is also a focus on how she used economics to fight against the gender and racial discrimination uh, in her work, right? Um, what is really striking in, in your presentation uh, clearly showed it. There, there is a lot of details. It's really rich and, and it's, it's great. Um, so um, it's not really the first attempt to, to reconstruct her work, as you said. Uh, I think you, you built upon uh, previous uh, uh, economists, such as uh, Julianne Malveaux, for instance. Um, so it'd be great to see where, where, where it's going. Um, I would like also to say that there's still some holes in her bio. So, so you obviously uh, attempt to, to, to fill this, this, this holes. Um, but it also shows how important uh, this work is uh, for, for the profession, right? So, uh, as I said, limited uh, comments here. So, what I would like to, to talk about here, let me see, uh, yes, is uh, the first comment that I would like to say is, um, how would you explain the shift from international economics to labor economics? It's not uncommon for economists to change fields or subfields, but, but is, is there anything uh, behind that? Um, is it only a matter of opportunity? Is it a, a change of uh, taste? Or, or so, so maybe that's, that's something you wanna work on. And while I was reading your, your paper, maybe I'm reading too much into it, but uh, I've seen a parallel with, uh, not a contemporary, but someone I would say younger, right? Uh, Lisa Cook, also another um, uh, Black economist. Um, Lisa Cook also worked on international economics, and I think she started on transition economics. So, is there uh, something here where you know you have some some economists who would start with international and then change? So maybe I'm reading too much into it, but it came to mind, and I wanted to share this uh, uh, with you. Um, I would like also to encourage you to, to dig deeper on who she was and to go beyond the, the important fact that she was the first uh, woman to receive an economics doctorate at Yale and uh, the first woman to receive tenure at, at Sloan and MIT. Obviously, this is very important, but, but I think that it might be reductive uh, uh, for her. Um, so, so, so maybe to, to see if there is more. And, and, and my suggestion is to look at more on her influences. You, 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 you answered the, the issue of the, the network, right? But I would like to see more on her in, influences, whether theoretical, um, you know, or influences in her work, um, you know. Uh, what, what was the kind of readings, you know, that, that she, she was subjected to? Um, you know, study the references in her own uh, writings. Did she maintain a correspondence, for instance, with whom, right? Um, so I think it would be interesting to pursue uh, that. Um, and, and I also wanted to know more about her views on other Black economists, contemporary and past, right? Past economists. Um, is there any direct, you know, uh, explicit a reference discussions about that. Obviously, she was involved in the NEA, but um, you know, in her work, uh, uh, are there any you know citations or references? Okay, it would be interesting to explore uh, those leads. And you started obviously, but to 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 pursue in that direction. Um, I would like to discuss now her views on on discrimination. So, you clearly. Uh, uh, you know, and correctly uh, mentioned the fact that uh, her views on discrimination are not exposed in theoretical papers, but are recorded in multiple reports and published uh, documents. 
So there is a necessity to reconstruct, right, her views on discrimination. And, and perhaps you want to say more, you would like to say more on, on the process. Did she try to produce a synthesis of her views on the topic? I think it's particularly important, right? You mentioned uh, in in a couple of instances uh, instances in the paper that in 1973 she made clear that the previous literature in economics, I quote, has not produced analytical models that could be used for policy planning. End of quote, right? I think she mentioned, uh, um, you know, uh, Arrow, uh, and I'm not sure she mentioned Becker, but anyway, um, it would be nice to have more. Uh, um, you know, information about her reaction to, to Becker's model. You know, I mentioned earlier how problematic that, that, mo uh, that model is, but uh, did she come up with uh, an actual uh, view on Becker's model on, uh, based on taste discrimination? Uh, what about, you know, Arrow um, or, and Phelps as well? All, all these models were produced in the early, aside of Becker, right? But uh, Arrow and Phelps, uh, um, were produced in the early 70s. So she had to have some type of opinions on those models, you know. Um, so it would be interesting to think about that. So I was thinking about one particular area, right? Um, and I'm thinking about Becker here again. Um, essentially, with Becker, um, you know, discrimination and not necessarily racism, but discriminations are reduced to a supply and demand analysis. What did she think about that? You know, this this view of discriminations in terms of supply and demand. Did she share it? I would say no, but who knows? Maybe you can say more on that or try to know more uh, about this uh, question. And what did she propose instead, right? Did she provide an alternative theory based on her time at the EEOC? Um, I know that in your paper, you talk about the dispar uh, disparate impact doctrine. Um, is it the only aspect, uh, the only question that changed her views on the topic? And by the way, as I'm you know, speaking, I'm thinking about another point that I failed to, to include in my comment. Uh, did she have a, a view on law and economics as a field or the influence of you know, the legal you know, work don't, done on, you know, how to uh, fight uh, discrimination, how to detect and, and fight discrimination, and it just came to mind, right? Um, so uh, I will also, and, and that would be my last point here, uh, suggest that you perhaps uh, interview uh, some of the uh, great folks at, at the NEA. I thought about uh, Bernard Anderson and, and, and Margaret Sims, uh, both past presidents of the NEA, and if I, you know, my, my memory serves me and you showed the picture, um, they were both in the committee or one of the two were president, was president uh, when she was awarded uh, the Westerfield Award, right? Um, the highest prize of, of the NEA. I think it's in 81, 82 or 82. So I'll, you know, I'll be happy to, to serve as a conduit uh, to make it happen. But uh, it would be nice if you can you know, uh, speak with, with um, folks like, like this, and I'm sure that among the audience right now, you have more folks who can share, you know, what they know about uh, Phyllis Wallace. Um, uh, the one more point, uh, last point, sorry, is to say that, um, you know, there are many, many folks who look forward to, to, to see where the, everything is going. So thank you for this work, tremendous work. Thank you. Can I you're muted, uh, Evelyn. Sorry about that. Thanks very much, Guy. I'm going to move directly onto the third paper because we have a hard stop um, and uh, I don't want to run out of time. So take it away, Marcia. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. So uh, thank you for uh, uh, attending uh, this session. It is a wonderful session so far, and I'm very happy to say that this is uh, the first NEA, combined NEA uh, HES session uh, on uh, many histories that still have to be explored 
and the two examples just before me show that the necessity of it. So I'm very happy with the session to start with. Uh, my um, my uh, motivation to, to write this paper is actually coming from uh, some remarks Karl Popper made in his Open Society and his enemies about what he said about what he called uh, methodological uh, essentialism, where you 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 take a social group and then you research the group for having certain kind of essential, typical or essential characteristics. And, and this is a common trend in which you will find in many statistical researchers where you use the statistics to find something about, about the typology or the essential characteristics of a group. And this is, and so my interest started there. And then I arrived at, uh, well, uh, of course, I, that's, that's, you get arrive at, at at the uh, the foundations of statistics, and and uh, for those it has already been referred to in uh, the earlier two talks, but there is a clear eugenetic uh, roots in uh, modern statistics, and this is uh, as you can see here, there's a, a presentation by Galton on eugenetics where he defines what it is, and and uh, it is read before the Journal of Sociology of, for the uh, Sociological Society. This was chaired by Carl Pearson, and both are the founders of modern statistics. And, and so what I want to show you is a, a, a very specific method Elton has developed with the aim to, to found genetics with some objective uh, methodology. And, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, just to give the spoiler, in his sense, in his view, it was a failure. But it is interesting to see the attempt and also how it reflects actually on our current beliefs in ethnic uh, profiling. And so that's the connection with, with the past, with the current situations. This is about my uh, motivations. Let me say what is the object that I'm talking about. These as uh, this is not from Galpin, uh, but this is just to show you what what the, the kind of portraits, the kind of uh, uh, we uh, photographs at the actual we are talking about. If you look at this picture, is it is the 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 people around the center picture are real people. The center picture is not a real person. It is a composition of the photographs of the other ones. And in this case, it is Boston physicians at a certain time. And so this is actually the, the method that was uh, used and actually developed by Elton to get at the characteristics of a social group. Uh, and uh, this, this is not Galton, I emphasize this, because Galton was not interested in Boston physicians uh, but he was interested in all the things, and I come back to that. So uh, the quote, and I give you this full quotation, and uh, because it re really clarifies his is the aim of of making these photographs, these composites. This photographic process enables us to obtain, with mechanical precision, a generalized picture, one representing no man in particular but portrays an imaginary figure, possessing the average features of any given group of men. These ideal faces have a surprising air of reality. Uh, this, perhaps not this one, but the Galton's ones they have, really have. Nobody would, would glance at one of them for the first time without this being the likeness of a living person. Yet, as I said, no such thing. It is a portrait, and this is important, because that's why I underlined it. it is a portrait of a type and not of an individual. So what you see here is a type. And so this is the aim. And um, uh, so the aim is to, to find a typical characteristic of, of sort of specific kind of social groups uh, he was interested in. And, and, and but this distinguishes from his other work, because he, this is a general project he was uh, employing, but he did want to use uh, for this for this 
purposely want to use photographs. Why? Because if you want to find a typical characteristic or essential to characteristic, they're not often a metric. He tried to do it with metrics or to with some sort of kind of measures, but uh, uh, he, he had an idea that the photograph, which was a new technique at that time, could help him much better than just by, by measurements. And, and so to find, and, and so he used this, this, uh, uh, this the technique, sorry, I go too quickly, um, to, uh, to, 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 to find in, in, in a more uh, objective way, the emphasis is objectivity. I, I want to emphasize it and come back to that later, but in a very objective way to get to the type. The cases he studied uh, uh, for this is uh, uh, so, so ill people, um, uh, criminals and Jews. And these were the three social groups he was interested in for his uh, our genetic uh, project. He was not interested in the Boston situation. Um, the, the idea comes actually from Ketele, uh, which is, uh, can be considered as the founder of social statistics. And, and he admitted that. This is a quotation where he said where he got it from. It was Ketele that were the first adapted for the knowledge of the fact that the amount and frequency of deviation from the average among members of the same race in respect to each and every characteristic tends to conform to the mathematical law of deviation. So there is a kind of, if you look at a social group, there is some kind of an average, which tells you a lot more about the, the group you're interested in, the race you're interested in, and the individuals. So it is the, the average that should, uh, should uh, find uh, to be detected. And it just the, the left one is, in, uh, uh, is something developed by Pearson, but this is, the, this is very often how it's presented. So this, these, these uh, bullets, bullet holes, and, and then you have in the center the bullseye where the average is. And just, I want you to remind me that the first photograph I showed you, the people around the, the, the center feet, well, that's the same kind of image. Yes, you're interested in the central image, the average, and not in the, all the individual dots around it. So, so that is the same kind of uh, uh, interest that where it comes from. Uh, as I said, the emphasis for Galton, because he wanted to have a scientific basis for, for, for his project. And, and it's very much as the historians of science, uh, uh, Lorraine Destin and Peter Kellas has called mechanical objectivity. So that is the reduction of, of any subjective bias as much as possible. And Galton believed that the photograph and the photographic technique would allow him to, uh, to arrive at this objective uh, uh, kind of characterization of, of a type. The left one uh, is actually easier to, the, the, the bottom one is uh, the extensive one. I don't, I don't see why you see the arrow, but it's the bottom one is a later much more objective kind of uh, attempt to, to build it. But actually the principles itself, you, could, you, put, you put a photograph in front of a camera for eight seconds, and then you put another photograph of the same group for the same camera, and then you open the camera again for some minutes, again and again, till you have uh, done this for, for eight or 10 uh, photographs. And then the, the, the composite is actually made by, by, uh, on the photographic plate. Okay, so that is just about, so that's, that's the idea. That's the basic idea. And he spent many pages in several kinds of outlets and publication to, 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 to explain what the method is. I, I guess, I'm pretty sure about it, that this is an own developed uh, methodology. Okay, so what are the, uh, the cases he, uh, he uh, studied? First, he was, uh, interested in the criminal and the criminal was defined by him as his conscience is almost deficient. His instincts are vicious and his power of self-control is very, uh, uh, the power, his power of self-control is very weak. And so that is the image you want to get at. And so what you see here, and that is interesting to see, these are already composites. 
Again, I want to emphasize these are not real people. These are composite photos of, uh, of these vicious, violent uh, criminals as he defined them. And, and so this is, uh, uh, this is the first example. And how did he collect them? So he got a lot, he was uh, acquainted with uh, uh, someone uh, uh, working at the uh, prison, in London prisons, and he got a lot of photographs because the, when they enter the uh, uh, prison, they are photographed. So he used these photographs, which are quite standardized, to make these composites. And he did it in the following way by familiarizing myself with the collection and continually sorting the photographs in tentative way. Certain natural classes, the underlying is mine, but just to emphasize what he was aiming at, the certain natural classes began to appear, some of which are exceedingly well marked. It was also very evident that the three groups of criminals contributed in very different proportions to the different physiognomic classes. So you had here, uh, not in the photograph, but in, in, in his work, he, he found several classes of, of criminals in this way. The second example was people suffering from tuberculosis. And uh, he, he, uh, he didn't have the photographs, so he, he had to make them. And so they had them collected from uh, two uh, London hospitals. Uh, and, um, and so uh, they had, of course, certain kind of selection to be made. You couldn't photograph all the patients, so they had an age group uh, they uh, uh, secured, which they want to have uh, the photographs of. And this is the numbers of males and females. And um, Interesting here, and this is what I come back to that, is uh, the composite didn't show what they wanted to have. They didn't find the average photograph, didn't show the characteristics they were looking for. Why was that? And how was this being repaired? And this is very important for my, for my story. In the first instance, the, the selection was done in, a, in, a, in, a, it's what, in an un unbiased way of, of the first way. That is that you have this, what you see here is this, this table. And, and so you can, uh, you have all, this is a classification table for each photograph, the person there's an age, there's an extent of the disease, the duration of the disease, and all kinds of characteristics which were used to, to find uh, a, a selection, a first selection. And that is a brief duration and advanced disease was selected and the cases of which they had hereditary taint is strong because they hope that these cases would show more clearly the characteristics of uh, of the closest patient. The result, as I already said, was no. Actually, the photograph didn't show an average woman as they saw what an average woman would look like. And, and then they, Galton used a second unbiased, called it an objective method. That is the, the, uh, the, the eye of a layman and not the eye of an expert. An expert, would, uh, so a doctor would uh, recognize what the disease is and would make this kind of sorting. And, but Elton being, considering himself as a layman, uh, did, like the criminals, he did kind of familiarizing with, with, the, with the photos and make the sorting based on that, as you can see here. After familiarizing myself with them and sorting them tentatively in various ways, I begin to perceive what seem to be, again, natural groups, leaving comparatively few that I could not classify. So, so I make composite of each of these groups. These are the photographs. I then sorted the composites and found that they fell into two main divisions, not, however, separated by any abrupt 
upgrowth line of demarcation. The first division had blunted and thickened features, the second had thin and softened features. I then made a compound composite of each of these two divisions and Finally, I threw both division into uh, doubly compound composites, a cocoa composites who formed the general average. So in the classification like the criminals, they found certain kind of characteristics as you can see here in the picture. But the general average, the co-composites, co 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 so really the average, everything has disappeared again. Okay, that's uh, important to note. The third group was of uh, Jews. Uh, he, was, uh, he was very much interested in the characteristics of Jews. And for, uh, for the photos, he, uh, he chose the photos of Jewish uh, boys from a specific uh, school in London. And um, and uh, so these, this is, again, these are not real persons. These are the composite photos of the group. And so we have here, uh, for this case, I don't have much materials. Actually, it didn't say that much how he arrived at this. So I'm not sure how much familiarizing he did with the photos, sorting of it. You can see clearly see there are uh, more than four groups because the, the uh, letters indicate more groups. But how we got at these groups uh, is not uh, explained. So I leave that just for now in, uh, in just open. Okay. Going back to to the the, the, the thing, so the, the methodology he was developing, and and so for the criminal cases is with no sorting. There were no something that you would say that looked like a criminal. And I, I give you the uh, definition, the definition of about the uh, criminal. And, and then he said about the criminals, the features of the composite are much better looking than those of the components, so the, the, the specific natural class for them. The special voluminous irregularities in the letter have disappeared, and the common humanity that underlies them has prevailed. They represent not a criminal, but a man who is liable to fall into crime. He cannot get away from that aspect, but that's uh, uh, yeah. All composites are better looking than their comp components because the average portrait of many persons is free from irregularities, the failures, the damage, the looks of each of them. So uh, the special expression of Different criminals do not reinforce one another in the composite, but disappear. Uh, the same actually worked with these uh, uh, tuberculosis types. Uh, the average has a very striking face, thoroughly ideal and artistic, uh, singularly beautiful. It is indeed most notable how beautiful all composites are. Individual peculiarities are all irregularities and the composite is always regular. The cocoa composite presents no future or expression characteristic of what may be called secondary types, the natural classes. The secondary types were the strumus and the tubercular, sorry for my expressions, um, which were found based on a selection that resulted in the two or composite is the photos I showed you. The same with the Jewish type. They, the photos were, these are nice guys, the nice boys. But that was not the, emphasis, the, the idea that he had from about Jews. He said, well, while driving to the Jewish quarter near the Jewish free school where the photos were taken, the suit that struck Galt the most was the gold, gold, Oh, sorry, scanning gaze of man, woman, and child that was no less conspicuous among the schoolboys. But these dirty little fellows individually appear to be wonderful, beautiful. Okay, so this is actually um, the, 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 now I'm going to reflect on, on, on this project. So it's, well, 
it is, it, it, in, in Galton's perspective, this is, of course, a failure of what he wanted to achieve. He, he was aiming at, at the type of the, the three cases I just talked about, and he didn't get at it. He didn't get at it because the average Jew, the average criminal, the average uh, tuberculosis sufferer is not being portrayed. And, uh, and so this was, um, in this sense, it was a, a failure, but it is interesting to see that um, about what, what is this actually, what was actually what, what, what happened. So, so if he would really be objective, that would, that, that, then he would have you simply had to admit, well, this, this, the, the whole methodology doesn't lead to it, but perhaps the time doesn't exist. Because anyhow, the, the thing, of course, went in a different way because he, he didn't do the, the objectivity methodology. methodology. He, he was sorting. The only way to get at these, what he considered to be uh, the right photo aiming at and we actually was very proud of them and these what I showed you is all published material it is not what I found in the archive but it's really uh, published in the work is that uh, the, 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 the of course the sorting of the uh, uh, photos based on the judgment of the eye looking at these photographs and making these classes out of the sorting the classes out of the, the, the amount of photos he had um, uh, and and the interesting here, it's very uncommon than what we would say that the eyes are supposed to be because it is, uh, it should be untrained. So this it is not about training, but it's about familiarization. So that is the idea to to what I uh, and uh, uh, and and um, and then the the photograph itself was actually not what the was aiming at, but was actually the test of the familiarization itself. Because when the photo looked much less blurred, you know that the sorting was well done. That is why these photos look so real. But yeah, so that's so that's, that's actually the method was not an objective method. It was a method based on his own uh, ideas about how uh, a criminal, a Jew, uh, or but uh, type of suffer look like. Okay, um, based on I have to a little be clear about the time. Um, so uh, this is a little bit about statistics. There's a very strong belief in statistics that the average has a meaning, and so this reflects what we have today. There is something interesting about that. And so the material to get to a good average, you need to have the normal distribution. The normal distribution looked like this, that kind of curve, as we all know. To get to this curve, and therefore, if you have this curve, the, the, the average must have a meaning, because it seems that the curve is pointing to that of, uh, average. You need already to have some kind of sense of what, not all kinds of materials can be used. The material already needs to be some kind of homogeneous uh, for those who are more expert on Keynes. That is also what Keynes is referring to. For statistics to have a meaning of the mean, you need some kind of homogeneous material. And that is what Balton believed what the sorting was all about. So sorting in statistics is very essential. Otherwise you get to a nonsensical average. And this is really what I want to emphasize. And um, this is also the idea about clustering. So the, the, the Gaussian curves shows you clustering, shows you that the most are in the middle, that's clustering. And that idea is very strong that that believes that that has some kind of ontology. That, why does it? Because we believe, if you look at these two, 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 two sides of this, this, assume that you have two, two kinds of statistics, the left and the right one, and it should tell you something about a certain kind of characteristic. Which one would be the better statistic? Well, the right one, because it's clustered around something. 
I'm now saying too much around something. What? There's some belief that there's something that makes this clustering happen. And that's the belief Galton also has. The belief that clustering is not for nothing. There must be a reason for the clustering. And the reason is the thing you're looking for. The question is whether that is right. This is clustering is all about precision. Clustering is not about accuracy. Accuracy is closeness to the truth. And this is a very often made mistake. And therefore, in all the measurements in the literature, all, all the statistic literature, you find the emphasis of the distinction between accuracy and precision. So you see clustering and you believe that it's accuracy that is closer to something because you believe there must be a reason for clustering. Yes, and that is actually what Galton is, uh, was believing for his method, though in his clustering idea, it didn't lead to what he believed in, no matter what, but this belief is still there. And that makes that people, that, that uh, statistics still being used to get to something which perhaps may not exist. And that is of course, uh, the the, uh, 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 the the kind of idea. So this is this the idea of the, the generic. This is what he was aiming at. But the question is whether this is something that is being created in a very strong way, which is still I am, would like to emphasize that this strong belief is still there in statistics, particularly if you think about ethnic profiling. There's a belief is there's something clustering, there's something happening in the middle in a very specific way. One has forgotten that the clustering exists because there is some step in, 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 before it, otherwise you wouldn't get this result. And that is to make this group already did statistic homogeneous. And never forget that aspect. Uh, conclusions. Um, uh, no, but the conclusions I speak for them. I, I've said enough, and because I, I think we are running out of time, and, and so I leave it here. I think I've said enough. Thank you for for your time. Thanks very much, Marcel. Um, I'm going to pass this on to Guy again for comments. Okay, let me share um, the document here. Um, there you go. So thank you, Marcel, for your presentation. Um, I enjoyed reading the paper and uh, I have a lot of comments, so I will uh, do my best to condense uh, those remarks, okay? So uh, Marcel's paper presents and, and, and discusses uh, Francis Galton's uh, method of composite portraits uh, presented as a method of inductive uh, inference in a series of publications uh, between 1878 and 1906. Um, Galton applied his method uh, to three separate groups of individuals, patients uh, suffering uh, uh, from tuberculosis, violent uh, prisoners, and, and Jewish schoolboys. And in the paper, is it, uh, it is argued that despite Galton's claim of a mechanical objectivity, uh, subjective uh, judgments are necessary a part of his uh, method. The irony is that Galton's method failed uh, by his own uh, uh, metrics, right? Um, he, he did not obtain uh, the, the results that he expected. And, and I take the quote uh, again, because I think it's uh, very enlightening. The dirty little fellows individually appear to be wonderfully beautiful in the composites. I think it says it all. Um, so, so the account and, and the narration of the paper is straightforward. I want to say, as usual with Marcel, it is a good thing in the sense that it, uh, it allows the reader to focus on uh, Galton's method. But I also think that it is lacking in other areas, and I will say a, a few words on that in the subsequent uh, slide. So I, I want to say a few words on Galton's method, and, and, and I will uh, offer some suggestions for uh, for the research, uh, research and, and questions. Okay, uh, so let's let's quickly move on here. Um, I think the the, the first question uh, when I was reading uh, the paper is that is Galton inductive inference uh, method scientific? Okay, and, and I really want to hear more. Uh, I, I want to hear Marcel on that. Um, and in a sense, I would like to have a more critical account. 
of uh, this so-called method. There is a lot to criticize, not just on ethical and moral grounds, even on, on, on the method, right? And if I take uh, you know, one, one excerpt from the paper, it says that basically using photographs to study external physical characteristics of group of individuals resembling one another in some mental capacity. Now, if you apply that to Jewish schoolboys, what is the implication here? That all Jewish schoolboys look alike and, and have same mental quality? I mean, this is crazy. Um, so, so the greater question to me is, what is um, the significance of this type of quote unquote statistical work? But what is the value here? Okay, I, I tend to believe that saying that subjective judgments are a necessary part of the method is not enough, okay? And that's uh, uh, truly what, what I believe. A, a quick question, how do you correct for biases, uh, you know, when sorting the pictures? Because that's, you know, at a vital stage. Uh, whether, uh, you know, you, you deal with someone who's trained or untrained or someone with a trained judgment or an untrained judgment, how do you correct for biases? As uh, Marcel rightly points out in the paper, and I think it's crucial, the photographs uh, needed to be sorted based on likeness, right? Before creating the composite. And I think it's, it's, it's critical, okay? So the photographic procedure, and I'm quoting Marcel here, results into a composite is not where the inference takes place. It is the process of sorting, which is the inference. And I think it's probably the most important part of Personally, that's what I believe, the most important quote of, um, of the paper. So I would like to offer some, some you know, I have some questions and, and probably some suggestions for um, further research on that. Um, the, the, my suggestions revolve around uh, Galton's life, works, and, and influences. Um, I haven't, you know, I'm not sure most folks uh, know about Galton and, you know, um, his work. Um, so it would be nice to, to include that in, in the paper. And I would like to focus on the relationship between Galton and Darwin. Mm -hmm. I, I read in several uh, areas that uh, Galton was the cousin. I think uh, uh, Tim Leonard even said the half cousin of Charles Darwin. So what is the, the relationship between the two here? Okay. Uh, I think it's significant because we all know that Galton uh, played a, a significant role in the development of eugenics, not just in Britain, but in, in the British uh, statistical community. Also, and I, you, you, you talked about it, Marcel, uh, the relationship between uh, Galton and, and the Belgian uh, uh, scientist Adolf Kettler. So uh, as you said, Kettler's notion of the average man uh, revolve around the notion of someone being healthy, desirable, grand, uh, beautiful, excellent. And on the other hand, Galton uh, equated the norm with the mediocre, the ugly. So what's the story after that uh, when Galton realizes that, you know, he's not getting what he expected? Uh, what, what, what is his view vis-a-vis -vis Kittler's ideas, right? Which he referred to, by the way, as you, you, you correctly noted. And, and you know, uh, what is the relationship between Galton and eugenics? Um, the paper was initially subtitled The Eugenic Origins of uh, Ethnic Profiling. But I think that I encountered the word eugenic only once. I think it's page 10. Um, uh, you, you, you talked about it in your presentation. But, but I think there is, there is more to be said, again, knowing uh, uh, you know, the role that Galton played uh, uh, regarding uh, eugenics. I read in several areas that Galton literally created eugenics. I'm not sure about the claim. So I think it, it's, it's not only important to contextualize Galton's ideas, but you know, to give a sense of you know, where he's going and his motivation. And um, I think also that he, 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 he um, advocated a selective breeding, for instance. So, so I think more needs to be said on eugenics in, in, in the paper um, because it constitutes the backdrop for, for uh, the true motivations of, of Galton's uh, failed method. And finally, this is something that occurred to me while I was reading your paper. I think there is a relationship between Galton and Max Weber. I'm not sure about that, but there is an interesting paper by uh, David Redvalson on that. Apparently, toward the end of his life, uh, Galton uh, 
explicitly referred to 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 Weber. Um, so you have to obviously, you know, recall that uh, Galton predated uh, Weber, at least in terms of you know exposing these ideas. But what I've done is I compared two quotes. I, I think it's the quote uh, when um, um, I think it's quoted in the previous uh, uh, slide, the quote about the average men from Galton. And I also uh, literally superimposed the quote uh, from uh, uh, the definition uh, of the ideal type from Weber. And there are crazy similarities. So maybe again, I'm reading too much into it, but um, I think there is probably something, uh, uh, something here. So, so thank you for, for the paper and, and thank you everyone. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Uh, if I may, uh, Evelyn, can I just yes, please. Please very shortly? Uh, thank you, uh, Guy, for 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 your uh, again for your wonderful comments. Uh, let me say a few things. The, the context where you refer to actually in the history of science, not so much in history of economic, but history of science, there is actually quite uh, uh, quite a lot of literature uh, referred to the uh, genetic roots of statistics, uh, and and of course we should continue to emphasize that because people are tend to ignore that or say, oh, there's something of the past. The reason I've written this paper is to show how it is still there. It is not, it didn't disappear because it is so much part and parcel of the methodology itself. Uh, of course, it, it doesn't mean that every one time you uh, use statistical methods, you uh, using kind of racist kind of methodology you now, but you should be aware that that uh, is no objective method, even on a statistic where you get to something you would like to know about that. There's a lot of much more involved. So this is, uh, so uh, I didn't do that in the paper because there is, there is already, a, this is existing. And the name I would like to give is that Porter, for example, he has written a lot about it. Uh, one last point about your first remark was about science and scientific norms. I think that is a very important one. Uh, but we tend to, to forget that the norms of what science is constantly change. But if we today talk about modern standard of science, we very often refer to the same kind of foundation as for statistics. So it is, that are these people so they not only are the founders of statistics, but they also co-created the current modern standard of science. And we should also be aware of that, what that means and what the implications of that are. So whenever you use this, if you take a norm, even if it's a scientific norm for, the norm for scientific research, you should be aware that the norm does come from somewhere and has implications. I think that is also uh, emphasized in the former two papers. Uh, and I think that is very important to uh, to uh, remind us all about. And that is a task of historians. And therefore, I'm so pleased with this session. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Marcel. Cleo, I cut you off a little bit earlier, and I wondered if you, you had um, comments you wanted to make um, about Guy's uh, comments or anything that you'd read in the uh, Q&A. Uh, yeah, no, I want to thank uh, people suggesting uh, many things in the Q&A um, and thanks Guy because yeah, everything you say I want to do um, and some part of it is um, already yeah ongoing. Um, I just wanted to add something. Um, yeah, there is a lot of in terms of reconstruction. She's even talking about um, uh, Festanger to, to do a theory of nudge. Uh, to be able to like like there is a lot a lot a lot and so that was basically the things I wanted to say uh, as a sort of um, PR for a uh, young historian like there is a lot of work that have been done uh, but there is a lot to do uh, and of course in relation to networks uh, um, and specifically on the economics profession in uh, starting in the 70s uh, there is quite a lot to do and a lot going on um, at the NEA. So of course, uh, yeah, I hope this will be a way for the history of economics to uh, just uh, expand relationships with uh, other society, I mean. Thanks, Cleo. Um, I'm just gonna pull a couple of the questions out of the, um, out of the Q and A because I think they're very interesting and I, I know that only we panelists get to see them. 
Two of them seem related to one another. Himena Hurtado says, thank you for your presentation, Cleo. I find your question about the absence of a narrative on racism very interesting. Would there be a way to connect the question with two other questions? Wallace's practices seem to attest to her life experience, but it's less clear to me whether she explicitly wrote research published on African-Americans, male or female or black women in say the labor market. And two networks seem very important in Wallace's career as a mentee and a mentor. Could you say a bit more about who was part of those networks, how they were integrated, did they connect and so on. And um, a sort of a related comment from Lucy Rubin, an observation is that few black economists of Wallace's generation and perhaps the subsequent generation who directly addressed racism and black economic development were well received outside the HBCUs historically. Uh, anyway, and, and the Black community. This is slowly changing with opportunity for subsequent generations of Black economists. Sorry, I was answering to the question um, on the chat. Should I do that or? Yeah, yeah, I think you could comment generally if you wanted to. Oh yeah, so, sorry. Um, <laughs> Um, so she, so yes, Rimena, thank you for the, the question. Um, so she did produce a lot on those topics. Uh, um, uh, she, the main topic of her research was on um, uh, labor market for women, black women, African American minorities. Uh, she did a lot about the intersection also of those um, elements. Um, and also she experienced herself discrimination at all the stages of, of her career. Uh, but she, and I think that's why also what's interesting is her work on the discrimination within the economics profession. Uh, she did a lot in the values committee within the EAA, but also society. Uh, and I think the network is very important. And I, if, yeah, I can't say more because it will take ages because I think there is values networks she was connected and I'm not sure those networks by themselves were connecting uh, uh, together. Uh, and so, for example, in the seven, early 70s, about the values committee and activism within the economics profession, you have linked be, be, between several committees that are created. Uh, but for example, but it's very different. Um, they are received very differently. Just one anecdote that I've been um, um, that I heard about last year at the ASA. It's like uh, when the Black Caucus meet in the early 70s, uh, the uh, AEI apparently thought about sending the cops, like calling them to see what, yeah, what would happen. They never send the cops to the CSWEP. Uh, also the CSWEP has a specific history about, the, and, and, you could, and so that I think what's interesting in this story of networks is that she was part of a lot of them, uh, also a lot at, in Washington, a lot, she was really active in the um, uh, Association of University Professors too. She had friends in mathematics and other, I mean, and, and this position gave her a lot of, um, um, okay, I'm gonna stop here because there is one minute. I will, I will continue this later, sorry. Okay. I think, I think we're gonna be rudely cut off in about two minutes time. So I, I think I'm going to um, thank all of the participants in this session gave for your wonderful comments on three very disparate papers and all of the authors who, who I think have raised some really, really interesting points. This has been a really great session. And I'd especially like to thank all the participants in the session who've raised um, some really interesting suggestions for how to take this research forward. Um, I think that this is something we need to follow up on and I'm really delighted we had such a great attendance and such great participation today. So thank you everyone. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to you. Thank you. Thank you. And one minute before they cut us off, so we will. I look forward to you know more collaborations between HES and, and NEA. This 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 is really great. Amen. I think it should continue. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. This is great. I think we're going to get cut off now.